Good morning and welcome to morning worship. It's good to have you all here on another beautiful day here as uh, we gather to worship the Lord and to spend some time sitting in his presence and allowing him to dwell in us. John 15, 5 is one of our one of my favorite verses. You, we've talked about it quite a bit. I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches. The one abiding in the one abiding in me and I in him, they bear much fruit, for apart from me you do nothing. Jesus understands and teaches his disciples that they need him dwelling with them. Now, there's a small problem. John 15 is just before the arrest and crucifixion. So we're within 40 some days of Jesus going back to heaven. And he says, I have to abide with you. Now, they were comfortable with the thought of Jesus sitting next to them, right? They'd walk beside him. They'd eaten beside him. They, you know, they, they'd spend their lives beside him. And so they knew that when they were next to him, they could accomplish amazing things. They had seen it happen. What they don't understand is what he's talking about is not him physically sitting beside them, but that one day when he ascended to heaven, that the Holy Spirit would come and dwell with them. So in, in, um, on Monday, I'm going on vacation. I've got, I'm traveling out to Nebraska. And in that time, I'm going to be physically away from here. Now, will my heart still be here? Yes. <laughs> Tina's here. Y'all are here. My dog is here. My boat is here. There's all, my life is here. I want to be here. I need to do some other things. I'm getting away for a little bit. But I still want to be here. But I'm not going to be here physically, am I? But in my mind you're still going to be close to me. Jesus was going away for a little while at the ascension. Now, a little while and soon can mean who knows what, but he was going back to the Father, but he still loved the people there. He still wanted to be with him. So what is God's presence with us, his people he loves, when Jesus is sitting in heaven and God is reigning and ruling in heaven? What's his presence here? It's his Holy Spirit. He dwells in us. He abides in us through his Holy Spirit when he is a long ways away. He says, but you do not know him, referring to the Holy Spirit, for he abides, but he will abide with you and he will be in you. God's presence is in us. And the reality is God has always wanted to be with his children. We're going to talk about that in the sermon. His desire is to be with all those who believe in him, whether gathered in this building or another building in town or around the other side of the world. All of his children, he wants to be with him. That's been his desire from the very beginning. And he has always worked to be beside those who believe him. And the problem is that sometimes we, have, we say to ourselves, how do I get closer to God? How do I get him to be with me? To, how do I get his presence? And the reality is you don't have to do anything to get God's presence as long as your heart is given to Jesus. When you put your faith into God, he's already here. The problem isn't that God isn't close to us. It's that sometimes we're just not aware of him. We need to cultivate an awareness that God resides in us. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, we'd always talk about how you need to have Jesus in your heart, right? You need him to live in your heart. And what we're really saying is what is in your heart? The Holy Spirit is in your heart. Because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He comes through the presence of his Holy Spirit and he dwells in us. And that brings, yes, conviction and transformation like we talked about last week. But it's also the abiding presence of God that gives us comfort and peace and strength and insight and wisdom. It's knowing that we can get through all things because he is with us. It is that we can do all things through him. Not out of our own abilities, but we can accomplish the task he wants if we let him dwell in us. And this morning as we pray, as we worship, as we sing, as we listen to scripture, as we reflect, and as we seek God this morning, may what we be seeking is that our hearts and our minds would be open, that we might be able to sense the presence of God through his Holy Spirit, and that we might be open to him residing with us each and every day. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for the way that you love us and care about us and watch over us. And I just pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us in worship this day, that we might glorify you in all that we do, and that we might truly shine your love into this world because you are in us. Come move in our midst, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading is 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a called result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage <clears throat> war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. I'll be reading John 15, 1 to 17, from the New Living Translation. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for, using my name. This is my command, love each other. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> A reading from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 27 from the New Living Translation. Jesus provides the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who lives into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. 
And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have told you. And I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift of the, the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Amen. As we continue to reflect on the things that we believe and what the Bible teaches us and how that uh, plays out in our lives, because we have to always remember that Scripture was given to us in its many forms of stories and laws and commandments and history and poetry and all the different ways that it is the writing is in Scripture. It is all endeavoring to do one thing. And that is to reveal to us who this God is that created us and loved us so much that he would send even his son to die for us in order to buy us back from the sin that we had entangled ourselves in. It is always about a desire that God had to be with his people. As we talked about last week, as we are considering the Holy Spirit and learning to dance with God's Holy Spirit. Perhaps not always literally, but at least figuratively and spiritually, how do we move with the very breath of God? And we talked about how both in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word, okay, this is our pop quiz, the Hebrew word for spirit in the Old Testament is... Good job, good job. You got part way, ruach. <laughs> Ruach it means breath, it means wind, it means spirit, it means life. And the Greek word in the New Testament for the spirit, which means exactly the same thing as the Old Testament word for spirit means is? No. What kind of tires do you have in your car? Pneumatic tires? Pneuma. Pneuma. Breath, spirit, air is the Greek word for spirit. And the idea that I think is helpful to us is that the, our desire should always be that our very life, our very breath should reflect the spirit of God being in us. We should let his breath become our life. His pneuma fill us. His ruach fill us so that we might breathe out the very love of God every place that we go. And so when we think about Holy Spirit, the there's all sorts of things that uh, he can, we can talk about in that. Um, today I want us to think about his abiding presence, his sitting with us, his living in us, his dwelling in us. How are we connected to him? And beyond the how is the why. What is the purpose of having the Holy Spirit in our lives? What is God wanting and is this something he just kind of came up with after Jesus? And Jesus was like, you know, one day, you know, Dad, I'm going to go home and you ought to do something. God's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. No, of course God knew where he was going with this the whole time, didn't he? And when we look at the Old Testament, we see what God's desire is and how he wants us to be with him even today. So two passages that jump out to me are Exodus chapter 28, excuse me, chapter 25, verse 8. Um, and these are the instructions for how to build the tabernacle. The, the Israelite people have been rescued out of Egypt and slavery. They brought through the Red Sea. They're wandering around in the wilderness now. 
And God says, I want to be with you and I want you to do something for me. And he said, let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in their midst. This is a callback to the Garden of Eden where he walked in the cool of the evening with them, where he was there with them. He wanted to hang out with them. I mean, I just, there's no other way to say that. And now that they're wandering in the wilderness, he says, I need you to build a place for me so that I can come and be with you. And then he launches into this long, laborious, highly detailed description of making the tabernacle. And if you read all those descriptions, and there's a lot of them, there was exactly how you're supposed to do this, what you see is the inside of the tabernacle, inside the court and inside the tent of the tabernacle, where God is wanting to meet with them, the space that he's setting aside and will cleanse so he can come down and reside with his people, is all decorated like a garden. It's all decorated like a garden. There's flowers and trees and so forth plant, painted around and embroidered in because it's a callback to when he was with them in the garden. Now, the tabernacle is replaced by the, also starts with a T, the temple. And he built the temple. And if you look at the temple, there's a lot of similarities between the tabernacle and the temple. And the temple, like the tabernacle, was a place, a physical place, where God could come and dwell with his people. But the tabernacle and the temple, they all went away, didn't they? And then, how did God come and dwell with his people? through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was the temple that walked on earth because the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. And he walked on the earth and he then shared his love and his grace and God's teachings with everybody. And then he offered his life as a sacrifice. He raised himself up from the grave through his purity and his love. God raised him up and now he sits on the heaven. But he, God still wants to be with his people. And Ephesians 3, Paul says this, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. God still wants to be with us. So he dwells in our hearts through his Holy Spirit. He was in the garden with us, the beginning. He came to the tabernacle to be with his people so he could dwell with them. He was in the temple so he could dwell with them. He walked among them in his son, Jesus Christ. And now he dwells in our heart. And what will happen at the end of time? It says God will return and God and the Son, the Lamb, will be with his people. So we see in Scripture that God's dwelling with his people was in the tabernacle, it was with the temple, it was in Jesus, and now it is in all believers. So when we talk about Jesus Christ dwelling in us, we're making this incredibly bold statement. We're all supposed to be like the temple. We're all supposed to be the temple. Because he says in Scripture that you are now the temple. We don't need a stone temple in Jerusalem or any place else for God to work. God never needed a physical place to work. He just wanted to be with his people. And now he's with his people through the Holy Spirit dwelling in the lives of each believer. So each one of us, Scripture tells us, is now part of the temple. We are our own temple to God. So we talk about our bodies being a temple. Because we are here to serve God, which is what the temple was, a place where God would commune with, his belief, with those that believed in him. So we should ask ourselves, if the Holy Spirit is going to dwell with us, and therefore dwell with us like the temple, and we are now that temple, what was the role of the temple, and how does that reflect and teach us anything about how we're supposed to live with it? Paul said it this way to the Corinthians, he says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of, the God, of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you, just like he lived in the temple. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. God's protection is not over a stone structure, it's over the lives of his people. He goes on to say another part, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Our bodies come from God. He formed us and created us. You do not belong to yourselves. For God bought you with a high price. That price was the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So you must honor God with what? With your body, which is your temple. And then in 2 Corinthians, he continued that same stream of thought. He says, and what union can there between God, be between God's temple and idols? If you remember the Old Testament, 
they got in all sorts of trouble because they couldn't just keep the sanctuary and the temple clean. They kept bringing other idols in. I mean, from Solomon on, there's this ongoing problem. He says, you can't have a temple to God and have a bunch of idols living in it. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. The desire of God all along is that he would be their God and we would be his people. So God's Holy Spirit dwells, it abides, it remains within and with each believer. His presence is the new life that's breathed into us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. It is his breath that transforms us to become his children and continues to work in our lives because we're now his temple. So let's look at the temple and some of the things that the tabernacle and the temple did. It's where God met with the high priest, with Moses and the high priest, then the inner holy of holies in that structure. There's this whole process where they cleansed it So that God could what? He could come down and he could sit with Moses. And we know that he came down and he sat with Moses and they hung out and they talked. And being in the presence of God, Spirit, transformed Moses. He heard from God. It transformed him. He became closer to God. They had a relationship. It's where God met his people. It's where the glory of God was resident. As the tabernacle moved around, they knew when to move the temple because God's presence was seen as a pillar of fire at night and a cloud during the day. When it moved, they packed up the temple and they moved with it. He was always with his people. He wasn't wandering around someplace else. He was with them. He was spending time with them. It's where they worshiped daily. Every day they conducted worship there. It's where sins were forgiven through the sacrifices and the offerings. And it was a visual representation to all the Israelites and anybody else who came to the camp. Now this is where God is with his people. Where's your God? Our God is in this tabernacle. He meets with us each and every day. He's not there as some stone idol, but he's this pillar of fire. He's this cloud by day. God was there. And when they build the temple, the same things are going on in the temple, except now it's sitting in Jerusalem. It's not moving around with the people. It's sitting in Jerusalem. So they come there. And once again, God meets the high priest in the Holy of Holies. The glory of God was resident there. It resided there. For your little trivia on the side, you want to learn a fancy word. The Shekinah glory of God resided in the temple. The Shekinah glory. You can go home and try and spell that. I never spelled it right on any of my seminary tests, but Shekinah glory. The residing presence of God. I mean, think about that. God showed up. He lived in the temple. That's where he was. He, his glory was there. It's where worship was conducted. Every day, the priest conducted worship there. The sins were forgiven. You brought your sacrifices, your offering to the temple. And people from around the world came to see the temple. What they were seeing and what they were being shown was what? God and who he was. Now when you think about that and you think about Jesus, it's kind of the same thing, isn't it? Jesus does the same thing. God's son is the spiritual high priest. We hear about that in the book of Hebrews. He's the perfect high priest. God communed with him all the time. In fact, we know God resided in him because it says the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. Want to know what Jesus was like? That's what the Father's like. You want to know what God the Father's like? That's Jesus. He worshipped in his daily life, didn't he? Jesus spent a time in prayer and worship with the Lord each and every day. He forgave sins, Not only through his death and resurrection, but how many times did he heal someone or cast out a demon or forgive their sins? Remember one time they said, you can't heal them on on the Sabbath. And he goes, which is easier? For me to say, rise and walk or your your sins are forgiven. And before they could do anything, he said, your sins are forgiven. He's about forgiving sins, just what God was about. And he was the visual representation to the world of who God is. That's why it's so important to read the Gospels because we begin to see who God is by seeing who Jesus is. So Jesus, in his life, is the temple. He has taken the place of the temple as the residing presence of God. And then after he ascends and the Holy Spirit comes, we now, as believers in Jesus Christ, become that temple and we take on those same activities. We are the priesthood of all believers. We don't go to a high priest or a priest to confess our sins or let him be the only one that talks to God for us. Can each of us talk to God? 
Yes. Through prayer, each of us can come into the presence of God. Each of us can touch God and speak to Him and see Him and know Him. So God dwells in the temple and speaks to His priest, and each of us are a priest before Him. It is God's dwelling place. God dwells in our lives through the presence of His Holy Spirit each and every day, 24-7, 365. He is there with us. I don't ever have to say, where's God? Because I know He's in my heart. And He's in the heart of every other believer in the world. It's where worship takes place. We worship God with our lives, don't we? Now, some days our worship is like on Sunday morning. We sing and raise our hands and pray and so forth. Other times our worship is just the quiet prayer of needs in the moment, the recognition of seeing Him in this world, being able to be touched by someone or someone touching us with His love and His grace. But we worship God daily in our lives, don't we? It's the work of the temple. It's what we're supposed to do. We are to forgive as we were forgiven. It's a place where forgiveness comes. Now this is is where it becomes a little bit harder, isn't it? Because God reminds us through Jesus that unless we forgive the same way God forgave us, right? And so I think one of the problems that the world has with us is despite the fact we have received the very forgiveness of God for our sins, that sometimes as Christians, we struggle with forgiving others in the same way we've forgiven. I don't know about you. Maybe you're all really good at that. But there are times that people hurt me, and I want to say, I'm not going to forgive you for that. But what does God tell me? I have to forgive. And what the world should know the church by is it's the place of forgiveness. It's a place where mercy and grace come. Doesn't mean it's always easy. Doesn't mean it's not always it's not it's always clean. Sometimes it's really messy. But we need to be known not as a people who are condemning and judgmental, but a people who are loving and forgiving. I don't know about you, but <laughs> I had a doctor in my church, my pastor in Indiana at the Eaton Church, and uh, she was a really good doctor. But every time I went to see the doctor, she complained to me about my blood pressure, my eating habits, and my weight. And I said to her one day, I said, "I, I need to clear something up with you. Last I checked, I pay you, right? Every time I come in, I give you money, right? She goes, yes. I said, okay, could you be a little nicer? That's all I'm saying. I mean, if I walked in and criticized you every day, would you want to, every time I saw you, I was like, you know, you're looking a little chubby there. I don't know that you needed those other extra fries. You know, if I, if I criticized you every day, do you want to hang out with me? She's like, well, no. I said, okay, what do you think I feel like? Every time I walk in the office, you, you got a critique of me. But how it didn't go very well. <laughs> we both continued on the same patterns we were in. But think about it. Do you want to go, do, you, do, you, do any of you here say, you know what, I can't wait to go someplace every day where they'll criticize me and they complain? I mean, if we do, we make sure they write us a paycheck, right? We, we want to go someplace where we're loved, right? Where, where there's mercy and grace and, and care and genuine compassion. You know, when the church becomes the place of genuine compassion and care and mercy and forgiveness and love, then there are no reasons not to be a part of it. But if the church is only seen as the condemning force in the world that wants to point out everybody's fault, well, I don't want to show up there either. We need to be the kind of people, the temple in our own individual lives and in our corporate lives of the church where forgiveness is no one. We are a people of forgiveness. Where We need to be the kind of people where when people see us, they are getting a glimpse of God. Now, none of us are going to be perfect in our Christian walk. I, I understand that. I'm not perfect, and I'm pretty sure many of you aren't. You know, we, we all have our little things somewhere, right? So I'm not saying that when someone looks at Jim, they're getting the perfect reflection of God. I'm not putting that weight on Jim. But what I'm going to put on Jim... It's the fact that if he's going to walk around as a Christian, the world should know he's different. 
There is something about him that's different, the way he loves, the way he cares, the way he is obedient. How many of those commands were about loving one another that we read, you know, keep my command? We're obedient to him. We care for, love God, and we love our neighbor. And so the world is going to see God in our lives. And if we happen to be the only person that they meet that they see God in, are we giving them any sort of decent reflection? Really, we ought to be thinking about that at times. So we need to let the Holy Spirit come and dwell in us. We need to be aware that He wants to be in us so that we might be His temple. That He might fill us so that we might be that representation of Him to the world. We need to know that we can carry out the greatest commandment. What was the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor yourself. That's what Mark 12 says. 28 through 31. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard the debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, of all the commandments, what is the most important one? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. If we are going to be temples of God, we have to be keepers of the commandments to love God and to love our neighbor. Not always easy. In either direction at times. We all struggle. But when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we become the kind of people that can share that love with the world and the world finds that love in us. You care for your neighbors, but you also care for God. We see that there. So, first of all, I guess we just need to ask ourselves, are we aware of the fact that we are a temple of the Lord? Do we think about ourselves in that way? And if we recognize that's his desire, that's his goal, that's what he calls us to do, then we need to ask ourselves, are we letting that happen? Are we letting the light and love of God shine out through our lives? Does our temple look like something someone says, hey, I see that and I I want what they have? want what they have we need to let the spirit of the living god flow through us and wash us and cleanse us and draw us closer to him so that we might be drawn closer to those around us doesn't always mean it's easy doesn't always mean that it's neat doesn't always mean that we're going to get it right because we won't but if i can remember in those difficult moments of my life that i'm supposed to be god's temple where he's residing, where he's sharing his love and mercy, where, he's, where there's worship is taking place, where sins are forgiven and grace is offered, and where the world gets a glimpse of him. And the way I do that is by keeping his commands, loving him and reaching my arms in love to my neighbor. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us this day to be your people in all seasons. Help us to be your temple in all of our frail and fragile and, 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 and difficult lives that we have. Lord, may your spirit come and reside in us. May our faith be in you. May we let you move in our lives in such a way that the world receives your grace and mercy. Not because we pointed at ourselves, not because we think we've done it right, but because we recognize that you are God and you love everyone and we just keep pointing towards you. Lord, come and move in our midst. Help us to be your temples so that the world might be touched by your love and your grace. In Christ's name, amen. A couple quick announcements. First of all, thank you to everybody who was a part of the Strawberry Fest. If you worked the Strawberry Fest yesterday or in the weeks leading up to it, please stand for me. So we can thank you for all that you've done. And especially, you may be seated, especially thank you to Lynn. Lynn, you have anything you want to say?
praise, and all the glory was for God. And again, I gave this strawberry festival to the Lord, and it looked like we were going to have rain. It looked like it was going to be so hot we were going to swell, swell, and we didn't. God gave us the exact same weather we had last year. The breeze was coming through, and it was just like the Holy Spirit was just wandering around us. The Holy Spirit certainly lives in each and every one of your hearts. You have given so much to the church, and you all did it for all of us and for God's glory. And I just wanted to thank all of you for all of your help. We had the strong men coming. We had young men coming and lifting everything. And, and all that we sold, the food that was made. And we just had a wonderful time together. Everybody worked together and loved on each other. And I think we really showed the community the love of this church. So if I, we also want to let you know that we have crab cakes and strawberries for sale downstairs and a few chocolate-covered strawberries. So come on down and take those out, and we can finish up everything for the Strawberry Festival and then see how much we made so that we can give back into the community. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. As, as you will remember, uh, so... From the, the proceeds from the Strawberry Festival, a quarter of them go to the fire department down here, the volunteer fire department, a quarter go to the local grade school. Uh, we give that to them for the teachers, to, uh, for supplies and so forth that they need. Then a quarter will go to our youth group to help with going to camp, and then a quarter will go towards our new roof, which, by the way, they will start tearing off and putting on the new roof Monday. So if you wanna come and see what that looks like, you can come and be a part, see that. Tuesday, we have worship team practice at six. And then we have coming up, we have our summer youth camp, July 28th through August 3rd, ninth grade and older. If you want to go, please see me. And I'm scanning through here. Um, remember that the celebration of life for uh, Reverend Douglas will be June 29th at 10 a.m. Uh, here in the sanctuary, there'll be a dinner to follow. Uh, we are inviting you, if you have pictures of your weddings or your dedications or time with him, uh, we would love you to uh, send those, uh, email those to us or bring those in and we can scan them in so we can do a montage uh, to honor our, our beloved Reverend Douglas. Um, then uh, Faith Night coming up in August 13th. I know it's a ways out, but it's uh, Faith Night at the Baltimore Orioles. We want to take a group down there. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, you can sign up out here in the Narthex. A little closer to home, uh, Tuesday, June 25th, uh, at Kurt's Beach is the hymn sing from 6 to 8. Michelle's playing, Laura Calhoun is leading the singing, and I am seeing that. And come out, there's a free dinner at Kurt's Beach gives us, and then we, we'll sing the hymns and uh, have a good time that evening. Monday at 11.30, the wild ladies are meeting downstairs. <laughs> Our ladies' aid group is meeting downstairs. Come and be a part of that. And Dan, you have stuff downstairs? Uh, yes, we have a good selection, as usual, of the sweets. Uh, we're hurting for the fr fruit and vegetables today, but we have plenty of sweets. And at the same place, the leftovers from yesterday will be available. Uh, they're all packaged, ready to go. Come on down, and we'll get everything out of that kitchen so I don't have to carry it home. Thank there you. you. Remember, that if you leave a donation for the uh, pastries and so forth, that all goes towards our mission outreach at Nisian and so forth. Now, I want to pause for a minute, and I want to ask you to do something for me. Uh, as many of you know, I'm going to be on vacation for two weeks. Um, uh, Bob's going to be preaching next week, and then the following week, um, Dan Wright, our missionary to the Philippines, will be here one last time before they head back, which is coming pretty soon for them to go back. Um, as some of you have noticed and encountered, uh, we are once again dealing with some, some homelessness here on our church property. Um, in the past, we've, we've navigated through that in the past. This time there's been some changes in the way that has uh, manifested itself. Um, and we need to figure out how we're going to address this um, in both a Christian way and a helpful way and in a safe way. Um, and rather than me just making a decision I want to ask you to, to join with me for two weeks while I'm gone. I'm going to be praying every day while I'm gone. That God will help us figure out how to deal with homelessness as it comes.
comes on to the church grounds because we have some folks that are living here now. And we've had that in the past, and, and we've made that work. Um, but I need you to pray about that and see what God says and what, how do we proceed forward. How can we address the issue in a loving and Christian manner and yet in a way that also is a good steward of our property and some of the safety concerns that have come up? Um, and I don't have an easy answer to that. And we're not taking answers today. So you just, just pray. And in two weeks, if God has given you something, I want you to come talk to me, okay, about that as we try and sort that out. I want us to be able to do something that is constructive and helpful and Christian and loving. And I'm struggling with trying to figure that out. And so I want you to pray about that. Now, the one caveat I'm going to say, whatever advice you're going to give me at the end of two weeks that you have received from the Lord, you have to be willing to be a part of it. Okay? So don't just tell me, you ought to do this, but I ain't helping. Okay? If God speaks to you, he's going to be speaking to you in a way that you might be involved in that in one way or the other. Okay? That's fair. I can have enough advice from the cheap seats I don't, I need someone that's down here with me, okay? So pray, so just pray about that, and um, we want to, we want to, we want to do the right thing in, like I said, in a helpful and constructive manner, and I'm, I'm struggling a little bit on figuring out what exactly that is, and um, so I want you to pray with me about that, and then in two weeks when I get back, you can share with me what God has led you to say and for us to do. I know that you may have other burdens and concerns that you'd like to pray about this morning. Our deacons will be available after the service up here at the front. They'd love to pray with you for something in need in your life or your family's or the community's life. Once again, we are God's temple, and we want to reflect his love in everything we do. Whether it's across the street serving strawberries, whether it's taking care of those or trying to deal with those that, are, that have no place to go and end up on our porch, or whether that's the people that we are driving down the road with or walking through the grocery store with or at work with. May we be God's children and may we be his temple shining light into those areas. So go be kind. Go be light in this darkness. Be back next Sunday. Till then, may you know the love of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ. And may the Holy Spirit hold you in his hands now and forever. Go in God's peace. Amen.